Um, thanks very much for that. Uh, yes, the the book which I'm going to be sort of taking some notes from to, today is the next one I've written, which is on the subject, Cardinal Wolsey. Uh, and just a heads up that, as you've heard, the anniversary of this great meeting, this important diplomatic exchange between England and France, happened uh, 500 years ago next year. So there's going to be a big exhibition at Hampton Court Palace. They're going to try and build a replica of one of the, the tents that was built uh, outside Calais for, for this field of cloth of gold. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I look at, is the relationship between uh, politics, between power, between architecture, uh, art, and all kinds of communication. So I just want to start actually not with um, uh, Woolsey potentially, um, but actually President Trump who, as you may have, uh, we have saw his lovely visage um, in the first talk. This is always a lovely thing to see, isn't it? Um, uh, his state visit to Britain uh, a week ago, as you may recall, formally commenced with a state banquet at Buckingham Palace uh, a week ago uh, tonight. Uh, during Her Majesty's reign, there have been 78 state banquets held at Buckingham Palace. There have been 18 at Windsor Castle and two at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. Now, you may think, well, that doesn't really matter at all, and in some senses, it doesn't. The, most re the reason that most state banquets take place in uh, Buckingham Palace is doubtless due to practical considerations. I mean, they certainly did last week with Mr. Trump using it as a kind of helicopter base for Marine One um, and a garage for the beast for his trips to Downing Street and, um, you know, Westminster Abbey and, and uh, Clarence House. Now, it's interesting because we know that the Queen regards uh, Windsor Castle as her home. Uh, Buckingham Palace is referred to by the royal family and the court generally as the office, so that's where they do their work. Uh, the Queen had never wanted to move to at, at her accession, um, and her leading court is, uh, insisted that she should. So perhaps her use of Buckingham Palace for state banquets um, perhaps tells us something about how she regards them, that is to say as work um, rather than pleasure. I don't know, but what it, what it does raise is this question of how different royal residences uh, and different residents of those who are associated with the royalty operated uh, in time. And how the, when you look at a historic building, such as Hampton Court or indeed Buckingham Palace, um, you should probably look at them as centres of power and all kinds of relationships that go on uh, within them. And if you look at them in that way, the way they're actually designed, the architecture of them, starts to make um, a little bit of sense. Um, 500 years ago, of course, um, Buckingham Palace didn't exist, um, but um, there were residences used by uh, the monarchy in much the same way as I've just described. And the reason why Hampton Court is there is because of this man, um, Cardinal Thomas Wolsey, an extraordinary fellow, uh, born in about 1475 in Ipswich. Uh, he went to Oxford University. He'd completed his degree in theology by the age of 15 which I think is about the age that many of you are or are about to be or have just been. Um, not only your schooling, but your degree finished by the age of 15. He was known as the boy bachelor. Not surprisingly, that got him attention. He joined the royal circle of King Henry VII, the first of the Tudor uh, kings. And when his son, Henry VIII, succeeded, uh, we saw a picture of Henry uh, jousting uh, as a young king. He was only about 17, or almost 18 years old when he became king. Um, his council tried to keep him uh, very strictly under wraps and doing what he was told as a young man, uh, but it's Wolsey who really, uh, we talk about, uh, talked about appreciation and gratitude, Henry was very grateful to find Wolsey because Wolsey changed that completely around and was so competent that whatever the king wanted, he got. And he was made successively the Archbishop of York, he was made Cardinal, then he was made the Lord Chancellor of England uh, by within a space of about three years, between 1514 and 1517. And by 1514, um, that's just a, that's an, the state opening of Parliament in about 1523. And you can probably see if I can get my um, blipper. Um, there's Cardinal Wolsey under his hat. And there's a deliberately outsized king, not because he's bigger than everybody, although he was, not that much bigger, but just to show his importance. And there's the House of Commons coming to listen to him. So this relationship between Henry and Francis was incredibly close, sorry, Henry and uh, Wolsey was incredibly close um, and was very effective. And you can say that England was in effect run by a two-man team for about 20 years. Everybody focuses on Henry, but Wolsey really helped to uh, run the kingdom for him. 
And one of the ways, one of the issues that came up very quickly was where they were in relationship to each other, given their different roles. The king has to be kind of everywhere, but he also has to live somewhere. Um, he lived uh, in Greenwich. You can see the palaces all along the river there from Weybridge down to Greenwich. The king's palace was at Greenwich, which is a long way from here. Um, Wolsey decided that he wanted to build, that the way they communicated um, with each other was by, uh, not Cadillac, um, but by um, royal barge, such as this one. This is actually the Queen's, the current um, uh, royal barge. Um, but there's Greenwich, so that's where the king is. His right-hand man, Wolsey, is at the other end of the river, and they communicate between them. That means they can do very different things with their different palaces. Um, Henry lives there in his residence, so a lot of the courtiers are there. But a lot of Henry's courtiers and councillors actually work with Wolsey, um, not at, the, at Greenwich, but at York Place. Um, it's gone now. It used to be a separate palace which belonged to him as the Archbishop of York. But that was like his office. That's where he worked, because most of his work was at Westminster, presiding over the Court of Chancery and all kinds of things which I haven't got time to go into, but basically running the kingdom for Henry. So in order to communicate, he'd go down the river on a Saturday or a Sunday to visit Henry, uh, brief him. Interestingly, the king had no palace in London or in Westminster. It had burnt down in 1512. Um, and it was not until Wolsey's fall that Henry actually acquired um, what became Whitehall Palace, based on, on York. And in 1514, of course, Wolsey starts to build um, Hampton Court Palace up this end of the river. And he does that because he wants a place that's outside from London, a, a sort of weekender, but it's also a place that is good for expansion. It was quite small when he, when he acquired it, and he built, those of you who know, has anyone been to Hampton Court? Does anyone know Hampton Court? The, the base court, the big main court that you come into, is basically a kind of hotel for all the people that would come uh, to be with him. Uh, because he was such an important connection between the nobility, the gentry, the sort of important political people, uh, and the king. And so along the river, uh, we are now used to going in through the gateway from the road, but actually you would have come by the river most of the time. Um, and they use, as I said, they use their residences very differently. When foreign ambassadors come, they usually go and see Henry first very briefly, but they're actually accommodated most of the time at Hampton Court so that they can hunt, so they got the use of the river, so that they can communicate uh, with Wolsey at York Place or at his place at Hampton Court. And so that the king is not having to be troubled overly by hosting large numbers of people. So um, that's the way they, they, they work politically. So the place that, uh, that people want to go to is increasingly Hampton Court rather than Greenwich uh, or even York Place. So much so that Henry starts to use Hampton Court as his residence. There's a bit of a myth that Wolsey had to give over Hampton Court to Anne Boleyn as a way of trying to curry favour with her when she appeared on the scene. In fact, he did a bit of a deal with Henry to exchange Hampton Court for his use of Richmond Palace. Um, and the fact that Henry then takes over that palace, I haven't got time to go into the reasons for Wolsey's fall, but suffice it to say that from being very grateful uh, to Wolsey for everything he did, Henry VIII ended up not very grateful at all for Wolsey's attempt to get him the annulment of his marriage that he wanted so desperately so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. And the two of them, uh, from being a two-man team, uh, they fell apart. But everything that Wolsey built, York Place, the development of that, and uh, Hampton Court, uh, was made even more politically significant because of the people who came to see it. And that's why, in fact, it's the king who moves out of Greenwich and up to York Place, Whitehall, and Hampton Court um, after the fall of Wolsey in 1530. So my point is a simple one, that when you look at art and architecture, when you look at the way buildings are used, either in our modern period or certainly in the early period, if you keep some of these ideas in mind, it can give you interesting insights into how power and politics actually operate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Graham Richardson. We're now going to move on to the fourth of our five speakers, which are going to be, it's going to be a doubleheader from Nina Samota and Dr. Carol Murphy.